eye on the Greenland ice cap, a field researcher notices something disturbing. The changes that I saw unfolding were much too large. There was something else at work there. Florida, 2005. A beach mysteriously fills with dead creatures. It sounds impossible, yet the scriptures clearly prophesy that everything in the sea will die. Indonesia, 2004. A massive undersea earthquake triggers a catastrophic tsunami, and experts brace for even worse. A massive global earthquake unlike anything in human history. 2008. Researchers prepare for a deadly worldwide pandemic. I'm extremely concerned about these things. I'm on the front line. I have a family. Are these the signs foretold in the Bible? Bible prophecy is really advanced intelligence from the mind of an all-knowing, all-seeing God. Are we approaching our own end? There will be chaos. Definitely be chaos. Is it possible that we are now experiencing the seven signs of the apocalypse? Throughout history, every civilization has considered its own end. In fact, the term apocalypse translates into a veil lifted, disclosing something hidden from mankind. The key to decoding the prophecy lies here, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. Revelation was written by a prophet named John of Patmos in about 100 AD. Of all the books in the Bible, it is the most mysterious and controversial. The book of Revelation is meant to paint a picture of the total devastation of the earth in preparation for the day of judgment, God's master plan for the end of the world. And the book of Revelation describes this master plan as being written on a scroll that's sealed with seven seals. As each seal on the scroll is broken, there is a new disaster, a new sign that the end of the world is near. For 2,000 years, these prophecies have evoked fear since Christ's death and resurrection, there have been all these false messiahs who've said that the end has come. However, every person knows, whether they're an atheist or a Scientologist or a Hindu or a Christian or a Catholic or a Jew, every person knows that we are on the verge of apocalypse. Could the biblical prophecy of the seven signs, written nearly 2,000 years ago, now be coming true? Astonishingly, modern science seems to confirm these unfolding signs. Scientists agree that the world will end. And scientists agree that many of the features of the end of the world may resemble phenomenon, catastrophes that are described in Revelation. What they disagree about is whether this is the will of God as prophesied in Revelation, or whether it's just an accident of the natural world. To those who believe in the book of Revelation, the warning signs that mark the beginning of the prophecy are clear. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. Biblical scholars have decoded their symbolism. A rider on a white horse, on a red horse, on a black horse, and on an ashen horse, all bring horrible things. If the prophecy has begun, then the terrors these four horsemen bring have already arrived. The fourth horseman, the pale horse, symbolizes plague. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. The fourth horseman of the apocalypse is a scary prophecy. 
The pale horse represents global plague. He's the horseman of death. Huge percentages of the population will die. Even in our modern era, we've seen unimaginable human suffering. Every year, over a million people die from malaria alone. The threat of global pandemics strikes fear even among scientific specialists. I'm extremely concerned. Number one, I'm on the front line. I have a family. I have children who are basically being set up for these illnesses. It's always too late after the fact. And we need to put more work and efforts into trying to find vaccines, trying to find preventative measures for these illnesses before they happen. As we'll see, plagues are only the beginning. The third horseman adds another dimension of human destruction, the black horse. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. The black horse represents death and famine. Increasing use of crops to make biofuels in recent years has helped trigger shocking food shortages. Some fear it's just the beginning. There's not enough food for the world and people begin dying in, in massive numbers. There will be tremendous food shortages. We see mass starvation. A top disaster response expert provides insight into this global human tragedy. There will be chaos. There will definitely be chaos. Rules <laughs> will not exist because what happens, unfortunately, is truly that survival mode kicks in. You've got yourself and you've got your family. And that person next to you, unfortunately, is just a person next to you. So if you need bread, you're going to get that bread. The second horseman brings even greater catastrophe. And there went out a horse from him that was red. And power was given to him that they should kill one another. The red horse represents massive war and conflict on planet Earth. The evidence of this sign already surrounds us. War, genocide, terrorism. Incredible human suffering unfolding all over the globe. But where is it all leading? Both secular and religious experts agree that the possibility for human annihilation is real. Jerry Jenkins, co-author of the Left Behind novels, explains his beliefs. It seems like with the natural disasters getting worse and worse and wars and rumors of wars and nations rising against nation happening more frequently and, and more globally, it seems like we're heading towards something and it seems like we're heading towards something cataclysmic. The evidence for the fourth, third, and second horsemen already surrounds us. But of all the horsemen, the first evokes the most terror. And I beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Next to Satan, the first horseman is the most evil figure in the Bible, the Antichrist. There are several historical misconceptions about this horrific figure. People naturally assume the Antichrist. They think of horror movies in 666 and some guy with flaming eyes who looks demon-possessed. He's not going to be screaming in stadiums with a swastika. People are not going to be saying Sig Heil. He'll come preaching peace. It'll be a time similar to today, where we have all kinds of war and discord. This will be a person who will be so um, persuasive and so such a, a lover of peace that people will be drawn to him and say, let's let him lead us instead of all these politicians. The book of Revelation foretells that the Antichrist ultimately turns to the dark side. He will play a central role in the final sign, the climactic war that ends the world. Armageddon. The key to unlocking the rest of the prophecy is the number seven. The author of Revelation, like all of the first Christians, was actually born and raised and educated as a Jew. 
What is the sacred number of the Hebrew Bible? It is the number seven, which is the number of days it takes God to make the world. Later, there was a famine that was coming that would last for seven years. But first, God would give the nation of Egypt seven years of bounty. All throughout uh, the Bible, you see uh, this theme reoccurring again and again. And where it comes to full completion is in the book of Revelation. You have a series of successive judgments growing in intensity. You have seven seals, and then you have seven trumpets, and you have seven bowls. And they flow in a continuing order, but there's a crescendo. It's a crescendo that has only begun. The next sign is a global annihilation sent from heaven itself. The seven signs foretell far more than seven disasters befalling mankind. The intricate prophecy describes seven disasters within seven signs within seven more signs. This particular global nightmare would truly come from the heavens. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and the heaven departed, and the kings of the earth hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. The objects falling from heaven are mentioned more than once in Revelation. In the book of Revelation, John is seeing what appears to be, in a vision, all these stars falling from heaven. It could very well be the massive meteor shower or massive meteor impact or massive asteroid impact on planet Earth. John's vision is rooted in the real history of comets and meteors striking our planet. Throughout history, phenomena in the sky, especially comets and meteors, have been deeply unsettling to human beings. During biblical times, only one power could cause the stars to fall. The most obvious explanation is that God is doing something to express his displeasure. Biblical scholars have discovered a word that's mentioned several times, one that ties directly to the prophecies. It's a star that derives its name from a plant with an appropriately bitter taste, wormwood. When the third angel blew his trumpet, a large star fell from the sky. The star was called Wormwood. Could the Wormwood prophecy be fulfilled by an asteroid heading towards Earth? Wormwood is a scary prophecy because it does such damage, killing so many people and so much plant life and so much animal life. It's clearly something to be so huge it'll be trackable by modern technology. What religion has interpreted as prophecy, scientists like Dr. Phil Plate now view as fact. Far and away, the biggest danger from the sky would be an asteroid impact because if we wait long enough, it will happen. A big rock is going to hit the Earth. 100% guaranteed rock solid bet on it. There are meteors out there. They do hit the Earth periodically. Meteors large enough to cause serious damage hit um, every century or so. Can an asteroid hit the Earth and destroy everything? The signs already surround us. A chunk of iron, probably about 50 yards across, slammed into the desert out there about 50,000 years ago. The amount of energy that was released, probably something like 20 megatons, which is 20 million tons of TNT exploding all at the same time. One event defines the extreme. 65 million years ago, scientists believe an asteroid hit the Earth with an unimaginable impact. Our planet got incinerated, cremated. A rock about six miles across, now mind you, that's bigger than Mount Everest, hit the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. The energy from this impact was beyond belief. That much mass with that much velocity is about 100 million megatons of energy. And a megaton is an average size hydrogen bomb. So 100 million hydrogen bombs of energy. The six mile wide asteroid caused damage on a biblical scale. 
all of that energy of motion was converted into heat. It vaporized a huge amount of seawater. It created a tremendous plume of vaporized water and molten rock as it hit the Earth's crust. There were tidal waves, tsunamis, that may have been hundreds of meters high. The Earth shook, equivalent to what they call a magnitude 12 earthquake. It splashed debris around the entire planet, which came back down into the atmosphere and heated up like shooting stars with about 20 million megatons of energy. Within a few hours of impact, fires were raging across every continent. It was literally hell on Earth. Can an asteroid trigger an apocalypse? It may already have, just not for mankind. The evidence is clear. An asteroid collision could happen. So it's not a question of if, but when. The Arecibo Observatory has been tracking objects in our solar system since 1963. It is still the largest telescope on the planet. Unlike optical telescopes, radio telescopes like Arecibo make their observations electronically, similar to how radar works. We have a one megawatt radar system, possibly the most powerful radar system on Earth, that we use to track asteroids and get very precise information about the trajectory of these asteroids. And therefore, we can indeed improve our knowledge of the orbit of these objects, and we can tell whether an object poses a danger or not. What they're finding is startling to religious and scientific communities alike. The objects that are dangerous to us are the ones that are big enough to do substantial damage. Uh, those are taken to be the ones that are sort of 500 feet across and larger. Of the 500 foot size, there's 10,000 to 20,000, I'd say. And we know where maybe somewhere between 10 and 30% of those are. By a conservative estimate, 7 to 14,000 unaccounted asteroids pose a threat to Earth. One as small as 100 yards across can still destroy a city the size of Tokyo. If one of these asteroids fulfills the Wormwood prophecy, if it is one of the seven signs, it would be an apocalypse unlike anything else in human history. If you have a, an asteroid that's a couple of hundred yards across, it's the size of an entire football stadium, and it comes in, it'll pass through the Earth's atmosphere and it gets very hot. So if you were standing, say, in New York City and it were going to impact there, you would look up and you would see this huge ball of light going across the sky. You would feel the heat from it. It would be like standing underneath an extra sun. As the Wormwood asteroid gets closer, the heat will intensify. It would get hotter and hotter and hotter, and it would be like sticking your head in the oven and turning it on broil. You would actually catch on fire. The buildings would be set on fire. Within seconds, every building in Manhattan will be set ablaze. But the fire won't last long. That fire would be put out almost instantly when the rock actually hit the ground. The Wormwood asteroid will gouge out an enormous crater. And there would be a huge shock wave which would just knock down buildings for miles around. The pressure wave, the heat, and all of this together would probably completely destroy Manhattan Island. Wormwood hits with such incredible impact that a third of all marine life is destroyed and coastlines are destroyed. It poisons the sea, it kills people, it kills plants, it kills animals. And so uh, there's tremendous devastation and it's, and it's global. Some of the most devastating human impact may unfold in the days and years after an asteroid hits, a phenomenon that's called impact winter. A lot of the ejecta, the material that's been excavated from the crater, can actually obscure sunlight. And enough sunlight can be obscured that you could actually shut down photosynthesis, and uh, plants would die, and the entire food chain would be disrupted. You're talking about deaths on an unimaginable scale, huge impact to the global economy, uh, tremendous amounts of areas where food won't be able to be grown. And so you're talking about long-term effects, not just the instant effects of the impact, but long-term effects that, that could go on for years. 
Death from the heavens can happen, almost as the prophet John describes in the book of Revelation. It is only the beginning of the journey toward the ultimate biblical apocalypse. Believers in the seven signs and scientists both agree a plague that could kill millions may just be a matter of time. The seven signs prophecy describes horrifying disasters. But for those who believe in the end times, God unleashes all his fury, and the worst is on the way. Disease. It's been feared by every civilization since the dawn of man. Even today, humanity is still terrorized by several epidemic diseases. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, struck 29 countries. Since 1972, malaria has killed nearly 100 million people, and an avian flu strain could set off a worldwide pandemic at any moment. The common thread? They could all be linked to one of the seven signs. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name was Death. It's one of the most frightening signs in the entire prophecy. Throughout the book of Revelation, there are numerous analogies of what I believe are plagues, the first and foremost being the pale horse. I believe that the pale horse represents the release of diseases and plagues on planet Earth. I see plague as a certainty. Yeah, it seems like it's just a matter of time before we suffer again. The forces of hell are being unleashed. You have plagues, you have diseases, you have death of almost every type, to the point that the Bible describes one quarter of the Earth's population perishing. A quarter of the world, well over a billion deaths, it's a difficult number to comprehend. Is there really anything out there that can cause humanity to suffer on this scale? Once again, scientists provide the hard data. Every 10 years, you're gonna get a very bad strain of a virus. Every 100 years, you're gonna get a catastrophic pandemic virus. We know this. It's not something that's new. All you have to do is look at your history. History. Our past is a long timeline of plagues and pandemics dating back to the beginnings of recorded time. During the time John of Patmos writes the Book of Revelation, around 100 AD, plagues strike in the areas of modern-day Libya, Egypt, and Syria, very near the island of Patmos itself. It's even possible that John has direct knowledge of these outbreaks. But the deadliest plague of them all hits during the Middle Ages the Black Death. The bubonic plague slashes through Europe in the 1340s, killing between 25 and 50 million people. The disease causes large, painful black swellings called buboes, which give the plague its name. By the year 1400, the death toll reaches 100 million worldwide and reduces the Earth's population from roughly 450 million to as little as 350 million. As might happen today, some victims looked for answers in the Bible and believed the plague to be the punishment of a wrathful God. The Black Death was invested with spiritual meanings at the time that Europeans were afflicted by this plague. It was the classic form of punishment that God brings down on Earth, not only in Revelation, but even in the account of the 10 plagues in Egypt during the Exodus. So the use of plague as evidence of God's displeasure is an old tradition and can be found very prominently in the book of Revelation. As survivors gain immunity, the Black Death recedes. But fear of the killer bug continues for centuries. The worst pandemic in modern times begins in 1918, just as the most destructive war in human history is ending. Doctors call it the Spanish flu. It's a deadly influenza that sweeps the world and kills an estimated 20 to 100 million people, making the Spanish flu more than twice as deadly as World War I. 
It's not really known where it actually started, but what we now think happened is that a avian bird flu virus mutated where it could be transmitted from person to person and just spread throughout the world very rapidly. An avian virus. If it sounds familiar, it should. Today, scientists are worried about another avian flu strand, a virus called H5. And this time, the danger is even greater. If that virus mutates and now can actually infect humans and be transmitted from human to human, that's a grand disaster. We're talking 50, 100, 150 million people can die from this. Just like during the 1918 pandemic, a mutated H5 flu will be easily communicable between humans. But today, we live in a much smaller world. Infection could be out of control before we even realize it's upon us. We have created the highway for these bugs to go all over the world on a day-to-day -day basis. A person gets on a plane who is incubating a pandemic influenza, it has a two-day incubation period. They arrive somewhere else in the world that doesn't suspect that a pandemic has started and transmission could be going on for a while before it's detected. And this could be happening in multiple areas of the world. Just the amount of people coming through LAX, how quickly can one person infect everybody else on that plane and then all of us around them walk through the gates of LAX and everybody who comes into contact with us is then exposed. Then I go home and my family and my daily life. Once that happens, we, we have no immunity. We have nothing. The symptoms of H5 start off innocuously enough that an infected person might not have any idea of the danger. The first symptoms of a pandemic virus would probably be similar to, to regular influenza, fever, cough, muscle aches. You'd have maybe a runny nose, some teary eyes, a sore throat. But the symptoms progress rapidly. Your muscles hurt, your, your throat is sore, you start coughing, next thing you know you have trouble breathing. There would be rapid progression, shortness of breath, cardiac arrest, renal failure. And it's about four days from when symptoms develop to when you get in a hospital, and it's about nine days to when you die. But as dire as these predictions appear, avian flu may not even be our greatest danger. The most threatening plague may have more sinister origins. The pale horse, I believe, represents death, but I believe it represents a specific kind of death. And I believe it represents the death that would come from biological warfare, either through an act of terrorism, through a security breach, through military conflict. A vial cracks, a truck crashes. It goes into the food supply. Numerous biologically designed plagues are released on planet Earth. There's no remedy for them. They spread like wildfire. Millions of people are going to die. What if we had something that couldn't be contained? It would take one, two, three hosts to infect an entire population easily, easily. As an expert on weapons of mass destruction, John Barton understands the threat today's bioengineered viruses pose. With the way bioengineering is adapting right now, I think that is our largest threat. Biological weapon systems are only limited by the delivery measure. It's pretty easy to actually do a bioterrorist attack. Most of these are invisible, they're odorless, they're tasteless, and we don't even know how to respond to bioterrorism. We usually don't have antivirals or treatment ready to go because a lot of times we don't even know what it is. It takes a while until we figure out what it is that we're actually working with the agent. Now let's say you have a terrorist cell. You have an engineered virus. It just has to get airborne. A biological released into the air on another human being in a high density populated area like Los Angeles and New York, you're gonna infect everybody. I mean, you're gonna achieve your end. With the amount of travel that Americans do, with the amount of uh, border crossing that the Europeans do, uh, we can easily perpetuate a strain globally within weeks. For doctors, it will be like getting hit with the tsunami of the sick and dying. Around the world, hospitals will be ground zero. We don't have the resources currently, or the facilities currently, to handle what might be the influx of sick patients into hospitals, ERs, communities. Every ER is full. Every hospital bed is full. Every nurse is maxed to their limits. Every doctor, ER physician is maxed to their limits. 
If that's the case, how are you going to take 10 more patients, 20 more patients, 50 more patients? We're not. It's not going to happen. There's no way the system can withstand that. Even worse, the virus could quickly split into several subtypes, each resistant to different drugs. Viruses mutate a lot quicker than bacteria. It just takes that one virus to actually mutate and form uh, that right combination that nobody would survive. If a virus is mutating so much and it's bouncing from host to host to host and creating different strains within each host, it becomes almost incombatible. So no matter how big our military is, no matter how much we try to contain, no matter how much we try to shut down our airports to keep this spread from happening, it is very unlikely that we could. Apocalyptic extremes emerge. Quarantine, mass panic, and finally, the breakdown of society. If the illness or mutation is severe enough, the number of casualty will be too much to handle. We wouldn't know where to put the bodies. There would be bodies not being collected, power outages, medical services being overwhelmed. When we're talking about the right mutation, the number of dead would be so great that we would have dead people on the streets. You have mass death and no antibiotic to cure it because they were laboratory designed, genetically engineered plagues. And I think that's what the book of Revelation refers to. I don't think God is sending down sickness on planet Earth. I think it's more of a matter of He's saying, okay, you wanted to design diseases, I'll let you do that. But then you're going to have to deal with the consequences. Biblical prophecy of a worldwide plague that would kill half the population is on a whole different scale again. And, and if it comes from heaven or if it's allowed by God, it's going to be horrible. And both science and religion agree, it may only be a matter of time. The next sign involves a different type of disaster, one that strikes the very ground we walk on, a massive global earthquake, unlike anything seen in human history. Many are skeptical of the Bible's seven signs. They simply cannot believe a loving God unleashing such a holocaust on humanity. But as the investigation of the seven signs prophecy continues, a pattern begins to emerge. It's a dark place on the fringes of human knowledge, a place where the differences between modern science and ancient prophecy begin to blur. The next sign brings that dark place into sharper focus, revealing a new level of horror and destruction. Within the last decade alone, the world has been struck by a series of catastrophic earthquakes. The 2004 Sumatra earthquake, uh, the tsunami from that event killed uh, at least 270,000 people. We just had an earthquake in China, but the estimates are 80,000 people killed. In 2005, there was an earthquake in Pakistan, again, probably killed 80,000 people. Hundreds of thousands of victims suffer, women, children, the young and old. Are these terrible disasters linked to ancient biblical prophecy? For believers in the seven signs, the evidence is clear. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. Some believe the worst is yet to come. This is unlike anything we've ever seen in human history. This is a massive global earthquake that will terrify people uh, to the core of their, their being. Imagine killer earthquakes striking all over the world at the same time. Even scientists are terrified by the possibilities. We're planning for ourselves here in the US, but if you think about some of the other places like Bangladesh, in Dhaka, an earthquake there, oh my goodness, the numbers will be staggering. For many devout Christians, it's a glimpse into the destruction foretold by the seven signs. One more evidence that God is trying to literally shake the human race awake to their need for him. Earthquakes play a central role in the prophecy, 
one that goes beyond breaking the sixth seal. Earthquakes are a key judgment of God throughout the book of Revelation in what's called the seventh bulb. It talks about an earthquake occurring that is so great that the world has never seen it before. Mountains are leveled all across planet Earth. Islands dissipate and disappear. Entire cities are leveled. For believers, a quake this gigantic and destructive would have to be an act of God. The judgments in the book of Revelation, that many of them will be intensification of natural phenomena that we see today. I'm not sure you can take a look at the natural world today and say, well, that's what it is and that's what it's going to be. It is literally a supernatural event. Earthquakes have a long history that predates the Bible. One of the leading scientists on the subject is Thomas Jordan, director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. Earthquakes are among the largest uh, killers of human beings uh, in terms of natural disasters. We know of at least 20, 21 earthquakes that have killed more than 50,000 people uh, in recorded history. Earthquakes strike along fault lines, places where the gigantic plates that make up the Earth's crust collide. With each plate weighing trillions of tons, the amount of energy unleashed by a major quake is enormous. In fact, the island of Patmos, where the Book of Revelation was written, lies in an area that's noted for its violent seismic activity. It's even probable that John of Patmos himself experienced the terror of earthquakes firsthand. The same is true for his earliest readers, the Christians living in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. To them, the symbolism of earthquakes was clear. They were the judgment of a wrathful God. Uh, we know when you get to the very end uh, of the bowl judgments with the great earthquake, that there's great fear and an understanding that they're facing the wrath of God. God is unhappy. Today, experts are trying to gain a more scientific insight into these calamities. In California, geologists drill deep to place sensitive instruments directly into one of the world's most dangerous earthquake faults the San Andreas. At this point, uh, the earthquake science community is faced with a situation which we don't really have the ability to predict earthquakes. This is the first time anyone has drilled into an active plate fault. By setting up a monitoring station directly in the fault zone, seismologists hope to learn whether or not earthquake prediction is possible. Yet to scientists, one thing is very clear. We know those events are going to happen. It's just a matter of when. True believers in the seven signs see a far more powerful force being unleashed. I'm not sure if those scientific explanations are necessary. If God just decides to cause an earthquake, he can just make that happen. We now know what causes earthquakes, and we know that they will continue to occur. What would have to happen today for an earthquake to be seen as a sign from God? To fulfill that prophecy, it would have to be a massive series of global quakes, striking cities along every fault line. San Francisco, Tokyo, Shanghai, Athens, Istanbul. The list would include cities in the US, especially those near the San Andreas Fault. It runs from the southern end of the state all the way through the urbanized regions of uh, Los Angeles and up through San Francisco into Northern California. Alina Dorian has spent much of her career planning for that dark day. The worst time for an earthquake to hit would be when you have the most population out in places where it's the highest risk, which means in high-rise buildings, roadways, having the kids in school so they're all separated from their families. It would be a tremendously violent event. The ground could move by uh, 10, 20 feet. It would be shaking strong enough that people would be literally thrown to the ground. They couldn't stand. And if you were next to tall buildings, windows falling out of tall buildings would be a tremendous hazard. 
Anything that falls from a significant height is basically uh, just like a stray bullet. Now add to that glass, which is in those large structures, tempered and made to withstand significant wind. It's basically falling blades. So uh, the amount of trauma that those things would cause would be enormous. Many of the uh, older brick buildings would collapse. The older concrete frame buildings would collapse outright. You'd see some floor slabs that were just pancakes with people stuck in between them. You're going to get amputations, pneumothorax, which are collapsed lungs, crushed hearts. If you're bleeding out and you can't get to the hospital, you will die. Even people in LA's modern steel frame skyscrapers the kind that are designed to withstand large quakes, aren't totally safe. At the very least, the building would begin to sway. If for such a large earthquake, we'd anticipate that we'd see collapses of uh, some of those buildings as well. In a few minutes, the shaking will be over. But for those who survived the initial blow, the horror is just beginning. Fires caused by broken gas lines and fallen high voltage wires will spread throughout the city. If you start enough fires simultaneously, you'll overwhelm the resources to put it out. And instead of slowly putting the fire out, the fire will start to grow. And of course, if fires get large enough and they just keep growing, that's what we call a conflagration. With water mains and roadways severed, a post-quake firestorm in LA could last for days even weeks. Thousands of people trapped in collapsed buildings or too badly injured to move will be incinerated. Eventually, even a fire this size will burn itself out, but the community will continue to suffer. It's not just the deaths, deaths are huge. But then you have six months, a year, two years of recovery time for everyone else. And not just people that are sick, but people that are displaced, people that don't have homes, they don't have jobs anymore, they don't have possessions, they don't, you know, their families have been ripped apart. Imagine afterwards trying to get your life back together again as an individual, as a system, as a business. I mean, it has huge ramifications. And this is just one city in one country in the entire world. Imagine the consequences of a simultaneous global quake in poor areas around the globe. Those buildings can't survive. Those people have nowhere to go, and they are packed. There are so many people in the little square meter. So it's, it's something that you have to think about. Catastrophe on a biblical scale. Earthquakes are a warning. They have taken place uh, throughout human history, and they are an indication that uh, God is still in control of Earth. The next sign centers on a disaster that's less familiar, but could be even more catastrophic. Death from above, caused by one of the most powerful forces in the universe. The investigation into the truth behind the Seven Signs prophecy has already uncovered a massive amount of evidence. To devout believers in the prophecy, the meaning of that evidence is clear. God just sends sign after sign, event after event, trying to wake people up. To these evangelical Christians, it reveals God's master plan for the destruction of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is meant to paint a picture of the total devastation of the earth in preparation for the day of judgment. Incredibly, modern science confirms many of the doomsday scenarios foretold in these mysterious prophecies. Scientists agree that many of the features of the end of the world may resemble phenomenon, catastrophes, that are described in Revelation. We also now know that the prophecy builds into a crescendo of disasters, a series of seven within seven within seven more signs. All of this is terrifying enough, and yet there are still more signs to investigate. Indeed, the next sign threatens something so important 
that without it, life on Earth would cease to exist. Our sun rises each day, bringing light, warmth, and life. Our world relies on the sun's rays for its very existence. But as the seven signs continue to unfold, what happens when the sun and stars instead bring death, devastation, and darkness? Biblical prophecy predicts that when the fourth trumpet sounds, hell will break loose in the heavens. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, the sun became black as the sackcloth of hair. Book of Revelation, Revelation 6, verse 12, the sixth sign the darkening of the sun. You have the sun uh, turning dark and the moon turning towards blood. It's a transitional period into what would be called the wrath of God or the great tribulation. When the prophecies talk about the, the sun turning dark, um, I don't think it's gonna be anything that's caused by man. I think this is, is God in essence turning the light out. The sun has been an object of fear and veneration for humankind since the beginning of time. Solar eclipses are such terrifying experiences for our ancestors that they often unleash widespread panic. But the dire predictions of this sign warn of something more than the temporary effects of an eclipse. Could the sixth sign mean that our sun might be darkened permanently? Could we plunge into a cosmic darkness so devastating that it would be interpreted by many as an act of God or a sign of the apocalypse? Surprisingly, scientists say that the possibility does exist. And ironically, a planet-wide darkness could start with the brightest light in the universe. Uh, gamma rays is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's basically light. Gamma rays are created by electromagnetic radiation and are emitted during radioactive decay. If normal light is like a feather hitting you on the cheek, a gamma ray is like a bullet. A single gamma ray photon has a billion times the energy of a visible light photon. That's what makes them dangerous. If they impact a cell, they can disrupt the cell. If they impact DNA, they can actually shatter or alter the DNA molecule. While gamma rays were discovered over a century ago, we are only now just starting to learn how deadly they can be. As Dr. Neil Gorels explains, the big breakthrough in gamma ray research comes during the Cold War. Nuclear weapons produce flashes of gamma rays. And in 1962, President Kennedy signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty with the Soviets. And this treaty outlawed testing of nuclear weapons above the Earth's atmosphere. The United States built a series of satellites to monitor this treaty. So these satellites had gamma ray detectors on them. And lo and behold, they actually discovered flashes of gamma rays. But the gamma rays are not coming from Russia. Multiple satellites would see the flash at the same time, and it wasn't coming from the Earth. It was coming from deep space. When scientists finally locate the source of these rays, they discover one of the largest explosions in the universe the gamma ray burst. Gamma ray bursts are second really only to the Big Bang as far as energy output. Uh, as far as we know, there are no bigger explosions in the universe. It's caused by a supernova, a very massive star that explodes. The inner part of the star collapses down and it forms a black hole right at the center. And what happens is it focuses twin beams of energy that shoot out in opposite directions from the black hole itself. They're like cosmic blowtorches, death rays. These things scream out at the speed of light, and the energy that is packed into these beams is, is staggering. It's unimaginable. In roughly 10 seconds, these two tightly focused beams transmit more energy than our sun will emit over its entire 15 billion year lifespan. There are almost a million 
of these going off every day. This is happening all the time. You can talk about asteroid impacts, you can talk about solar flares, you can talk about black holes passing through the solar system. But I think pound for pound, you don't get anything more terrifying than a gamma ray burst. Anything within a thousand light years that lies in the path of gamma ray beams is simply vaporized. Fortunately, there are no stars close enough to vaporize our planet. But the radiation from a gamma ray burst even several thousand light years away can still devastate the Earth. In fact, there's evidence that our planet may have already been hit. Several hundred million years ago, back when the trilobites were the kings of the Earth, these little crab-like guys that were swimming around in the ocean, it's possible that a gamma ray burst actually went off close enough to the Earth to wipe out these trilobites and a lot of life on the Earth. This was one of the, the biggest mass extinctions. It was even bigger than the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. A nearby gamma ray burst will clearly pose a danger to life on our planet. But according to prophecy, the sun and moon will be darkened. How can this blinding flash of light send our world into darkness? The answer lies 8,000 light years away. The star is called WR104. It's a funny name, but that's what we call it. And it's close enough to hurt us, and it may be aimed at us. It's reaching the end of its lifetime, and it could, any year, blow up. So what will happen if this distant star explodes? You would have literally no warning, because gamma rays themselves are light. And so they're traveling at the speed of light. And since nothing can travel faster, as soon as they hit the Earth, that's it. That's our warning. So basically, we would see it, and that would be it. Even though it's 8,000 light years away, WR-104 could trigger a devastating change in our skies. Strangely enough, it's this massive blast of light that could plunge us into the darkness foretold by the seven signs. A gamma ray burst alters the Earth's atmospheric chemistry. It can create a layer of what is essentially smog, a thick reddish-brown dark layer of smog that would block sunlight, and that would actually lower the Earth's temperature. It could cause an ice age. Photosynthesis will be interrupted. Plants across the globe will die. It's also possible the sudden change will wipe out the critical bottom layer of the food chain. Changing the microscopic life in the ocean changes the very base of the food chain. If you were to kill all of the plankton in the ocean in a very short period of time, life would stop immediately. The whole system collapses. It's a big chain. Everything is linked to each other. The whole thing's going to fall apart. Trapped beneath darkened skies on a frozen, dying planet, the effects of a gamma ray burst will be a nightmare for mankind, one foretold by the Bible centuries ago, a prophecy that for some will signal the end times. At the end of time, things will be out of order. Things will be turned on their heads. The sun, which is a source of light, turns to black, and the meaning assigned to this upheaval is the imminent working of God's will to bring the world to a final end. I don't think God needs to use anything specifically scientific to, to make it happen, but he could. I mean, if it's a gamma ray that, that causes this, uh, he'll use whatever he has at his disposal to make it work. In the vastness of space, there's no way to know if this sign will happen. Everything in the universe is a matter of probabilities and chance. If your star and your planet happens to be near another massive star that's blowing up, that's it. But the threat is out there. And at 8,000 light years away, WR-104 may have already exploded, and its deadly gamma rays could already be heading our way. And as frightening as this sign is, the biblical march toward apocalypse is about to get even worse. It's a disaster that conjures up images of hell itself. Scientists at Yellowstone take measurements. Something strange is happening. Could it be the site of a future biblical disaster? Could it be part of the seven signs? 
and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain was cast into the sea. In the second trumpet judgment, it talks about a great mountain falling into the ocean. That could be an asteroid, but it uses the term mountain, and then it uses the term fire, a mountain bursting out of the ocean, erupting with fire. It's one of the most dangerous and destructive forces on Earth. Could one of the seven signs be a volcano? A look back at ancient history provides a clue. The images of fire and brimstone that define hell were inspired by the flaming magma and sulfuric gas emitted by volcanoes. Like many violent natural events, volcanic eruptions are seen by our Christian ancestors as the result of God's wrath. Mount Vesuvius erupts in 79 AD. During the same period, John of Patmos writes the Book of Revelation. The eruption buries the Roman city of Pompeii. Hot volcanic ash entombs thousands of victims for all time, frozen in their final agony. Many early Christians view this as God's punishment of the pagan Roman Empire, exacted for persecuting their Christian brethren. A volcanic eruption is an indication that God is in control of the Earth, that he is the one who controls these natural phenomena. We know too well the power of volcanoes today. Mount St. Helens in 1980, Mount Pinatubo in 1991. These eruptions and countless others have caused humans pain and suffering on an immense scale. But for a volcanic eruption to be recognized today as among the seven signs, it will have to be of unprecedented size and destructiveness. The result of this great mountain-like object falling into the ocean is destroying life on planet Earth. Are there, in fact, volcanoes large enough to cause such an apocalypse? Science now confirms that there are and just as the prophecy describes, they can be hidden in oceans or even right below us. It's a phenomenon called supervolcanoes. A supervolcano is any volcano that emits 100 cubic kilometers or more of ash in a single eruption. That's about 100 to 150 times more than Mount St. Helens ejected in 1980 and there are supervolcanoes scattered across the globe. Taupo in New Zealand, a popular fishing resort on the North Island. Santorini in the Aegean. The Campi Flagre, just west of Naples, where several hundred thousand people live. There are at least eight supervolcanoes around the world, but they're hard to find, since they usually don't take the form of a mountain. Most volcanoes, when they erupt explosively, leave a crater a violent expulsion of magma that blows its roof off. When a very large eruption occurs, it leaves something called a caldera, which is a, a much more structured, bowl-shaped depression that has relatively steep walls. It's typically tens of kilometers across, and it forms by a settling of the roof rocks down into what used to be the magma chamber. There are several supervolcano calderas within the United States. One of the most beautiful sites may also pose the greatest threat of devastation. Yellowstone is a large volcanic crater measuring 35 by 45 miles. It's just shocking to imagine a single eruption that would evacuate so much magma and create a valley where there was nothing. But that's exactly what happened at Yellowstone more than once. Yellowstone has had three very big eruptions, eruptions that were hundreds of cubic kilometers or more. The most recent of them happened 640,000 years ago. We know that Yellowstone has erupted in the past. We know it could erupt again in the future. The question is when. 
Yellowstone Plateau is rising at a rate of about six tenths of an inch, a little bit more than half an inch a year. This is a product of molten rock beneath that plateau. We just don't have enough data to say what the probability is of this culminating in a big eruption. The data scientists do have indicates that an eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano isn't likely, at least not for a few thousand years. But scientific data doesn't sway true believers in the seven signs prophecy. When it comes to science and the scripture, I have never seen anything when you really examine it that science can disprove the scripture. However, believers examining the prophecy and scientists investigating the data do agree on one thing. If a supervolcano does erupt, our prospects will be bleak. The first thing that would happen would be a series of minor eruptions. They don't erupt simultaneously around the entire circumference of the caldera. Instead, they punch a single hole through the edge of the caldera, and then they unzip the caldera rim by migrating that eruption center around its circumference. Once this happens, the entire floor of the Yellowstone caldera will collapse. That will blast a gigantic column of scalding volcanic gas and ash up to 20 kilometers high into the atmosphere. That cloud collapses in places and produces a, a ground-hugging mass of hot ash that runs perhaps several hundred miles down river valleys. Anyone and anything within that range would almost certainly be buried and killed. As we've learned from many previous eruptions, the victims suffer a terrible death. What kills people is the ingestion of hot gases that cook you from the inside. The ash that remains airborne is carried westward by the prevailing winds. 11 western states, including a substantial part of California, become blanketed in ash. You're looking at a destruction of the grain belt in the Midwest, upon which a substantial part of the world's population living at margin depends. And uh, with that, then, a realignment of the geopolitical balance of power. Long-term damage could be even worse. Small volcanic particles and gases continue to circulate in the stratosphere, causing sunlight to reflect away from Earth. Volcanic winter sets in, very much like the impact winter caused by a large asteroid impact. Global temperatures drop as far as five degrees centigrade. That may not sound like much, but that's the only temperature difference that separates us from the last ice age. Once these horrific events begin to unfold, uh, certainly students of the Bible will recognize them immediately as events that were foretold thousands of years ago that are now coming to pass. In contrast to the unshakable beliefs of devout Christians, scientists are not as sure of the future. Supervolcanic eruptions could take place at several dozen localities around the world. The best that we can do is if we notice evidence that a major eruption is impending, to clear out the surrounding area and prepare for the possible consequences. Not very reassuring. One more mystery explored, but still more questions to answer. The next sign is even more mysterious than volcanoes, but every bit is powerful. It's a phenomenon that turns the very waters we depend on as red as human blood. Most scientists believe life began in the ocean. But could life also end because of the sea? To believers in the seven signs, the answer is yes. 2005. The coast of Florida is struck by a huge die-off of sea life. Crews armed with pitchforks and gas masks clean up tens of thousands of dead sea creatures washed ashore from the Gulf of Mexico. In 2007, a similar event infects the coast of Southern California. 
leaving the beaches littered with dead sea lions, fish, birds, and whales. It is an image that comes straight from the book of Revelation. The death of, of living things in the sea. Uh, at first it sounds impossible because the sea is so vast, and yet the scriptures clearly prophesy that everything in the sea will die at some point during the judgments that come from heaven. So there's no question it can happen and will happen. These massive waves of seaborne death are directly connected to the next sign of the prophecy. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. In the second ball in the book of Revelation, we see all the rivers in planet Earth turning into blood. In the third ball, we see all the oceans turning into blood. A wrathful God transforming the waters into blood is a recurring event in the Bible. But what does it mean? God turns the water to blood, and it causes the, the fish to die, and it means you can't drink it and sustain life with water. So the idea that blood, which is supposed to be confined in the veins of living creatures, is now in oceans and rivers, is a symbol of the dislocation, the upheaval, the catastrophe that God is willing to bring on the world when he is displeased. And it happened in Egypt, according to the Hebrew Bible. It will happen at the end of days, according to the, the book of Revelation. Throughout biblical times, blood has a very powerful symbolic meaning. Blood has always been, from the beginning of the Judeo-Christian tradition, has been a symbol of great sanctity. It becomes just as important in the book of Revelation, even the ancients who had no knowledge of human anatomy understood that what flows through our bodies and keeps us alive is blood. So that symbol of blood is a symbol of life and in a more exalted sense, eternal life. Blood can also be a powerful symbol of death. For centuries, water turning into blood is seen symbolically but now science offers a different perspective. Can there be scientific truth to water turning blood red? For reasons that remain mysterious for centuries, the oceans and places along the world's coastlines sometimes turn a blood-like shade of red. When this happens, beaches become littered with dead sea life. Everything from minnows to whales perish and are washed ashore. Today, we call these phenomena red tides. Red tides are explained by a leading marine ecologist at the University of Southern California, Dave Hutchins. Red tide is a common name for a group of single-celled algae that live in coastal water and produce toxins. They produce large blooms that can be really damaging. Some of the organisms that make these blooms actually have a reddish coloration, and when there's enough of them, they can make the water turn literally red, like blood. In fact, the book of Revelation is written on a small island in the Aegean Sea. It's highly probable that red tides are well known to the local fishermen and to the wider population that reads the prophecies. Given that the sign calls for our waters to turn into blood, it might very well be linked to the phenomenon of red tides. But it will have to be a red tide so unnaturally catastrophic, so extreme, that it can only be seen by many as a sign from God. Can a red tide become that deadly? Again, science offers us a surprising answer. The red tide algae produce very potent toxins that can kill humans and other vertebrates. And they can literally do the same types of damage that a nerve gas would do. The big culprits are shellfish, uh, filter feeding shellfish, clams of any variety and mussels. 
These are organisms that basically sit there and they pump water through a, a very, very fine mesh and they collect algae in their stomachs. Most of the poisonings that come from algal toxins have the name shellfish poisoning in them. So there's amnesic shellfish poisoning, which causes loss of short-term memory. There's paralytic shellfish poisoning, which causes paralysis. There is neurologic shellfish poisoning, which has respiratory effects. A lot of these things get into our food web by virtue of the fact that we eat some organisms from the ocean that are filter feeders. A red tide could escalate, and the threat could spread from the food we eat to the air we breathe. Some types of red tide release the toxins to the water, and they can actually get aerosolized out of the water and into the air where people can breathe them. That would be like our oceans emitting clouds of lethal nerve gas. The impact on people living near the sea would be devastating. If a gigantic red tide strikes all the oceans at once, a vast majority of sea life on Earth will die, as will the people that eat and breathe the toxins the red tides produce. The millions of other people around the world who depend on the seas for food will starve. The human suffering and death will be mind-boggling. There's no doubt that many would see this as a fulfillment of the seven signs. Both pollution and global warming are, in fact, upsetting the ecological balance that normally checks red algae growth, fueling a rise in the number and severity of red tides worldwide. If this deadly toxin continues to thrive, it could overwhelm the planet. If toxic algae win and continue to win and always win, we have a very dire situation. Those attuned to the prophecy of the seven signs agree, but for different reasons. I think what God is specifically saying, he's saying to the rebellious planet Earth, to the Antichrist and his forces, You've martyred my people. You've spilled their blood. You've killed millions of people that believe in God by taking their blood. Now, as a judgment and a final warning to you, I'm going to turn all the rivers on planet Earth and all the oceans into blood. So this sign really could be a terrifying portent of worldwide killer red tides. It also has a link to our next sign, where again, destruction comes from something that's a direct source of life on Earth. Monstrous earthquakes, devastating plague, dying oceans colored red. All are foretold in Revelation, and all have been witnessed on Earth. These calamities have yet to bring about the end of the world, but are they signposts, warnings that far worse is to come? Evidence seems to be mounting that another sign is unfolding. 1997, the Canadian Arctic, 100 miles from the nearest city. A field researcher begins to notice something alarming. The changes that I saw unfolding in the Arctic were much too large, much too persistent to be explained away as just natural variations in climate. There was something else at work there. This is real, and it's now. Giant ice sheets the size of Rhode Island cleave off Antarctica. Hurricanes rage with unimaginable intensity in the Atlantic. Cyclones bring death to hundreds of thousands in Asia. Droughts decimate gigantic regions of the world, and species are driven to extinction at rates never seen before. Could all these calamities be connected to one sign? Revelation tells us the seven seals bring forth seven trumpets, and the blaring of the seventh trumpet summons seven bowls. And with the fourth bowl, an angel poured his vial upon the sun, and men were scorched with great heat. Heat, the sun scorching mankind. One of the most alarming signs of the prophecy. And for the scientific community, climate change is unfolding with undeniable evidence.
the Earth is getting hotter. It's warming up. There are just certain physical principles that are inviolate. The physics behind global climate change are very solid. We increase the concentrations of atmospheric greenhouse gases, the planet warms. You cannot escape the physics. For Mark Sarazee, a research scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, the cause for climate change is obvious and man-made. It became very clear that we were starting to see the effects of global warming associated with rising greenhouse gases. Everything that we're doing in our activities, whether it's you know, building new cities, putting up agricultural lands, whether it's driving vehicles and putting gases into the atmosphere that we know help warm the planet further, we are causing this planet to warm. It's happening much faster than our models were telling us is going to happen. And that's scary. But for some religious experts, the evidence of climate change is linked to a larger prophecy, another sign of the impending apocalypse. Man will die from heat, sun radiation and poisoning, crops, water will dry up. There will be such an intensification of the sun's rays that 50% of the Earth's population will die. We're seeing natural disasters unprecedented. When you see on the evening news somebody sitting in the upstairs of their home because the downstairs is flooded out, I mean, it, it's frightening. Whether or not they agree on the cause, most scientists and religious experts do agree on one thing. Our planet is heating up, and the effects are catastrophic. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And then it's a matter of how severe is it going to be and what are the impacts going to be. Increasing the Earth's temperature, even by a few degrees, can cause devastating consequences worldwide. The change is going on very, very quickly. We're going to see a rise in sea level. We are going to see, very likely, more intense hurricanes. Uh, we're going to see increasing drought. You're going to see strife. You're going to see conflict. Increased terrorism as a result of global warming, it's in there in the possibilities. A rise in temperatures would set off a chain reaction. What we're going to be seeing is that that rate of sea level rise is going to accelerate. Why is it going to accelerate? Largely because we're going to see increasing meltdown of the Earth's glaciers and ice caps. What's going to raise the sea levels is primarily Greenland and Antarctica. Together, they're more than 90 meters of ice. A small rise in sea level, just 10 meters, would submerge much of Florida and the East Coast. It would displace 25% of the entire population of the United States. You might want to uh, consider uh, not living in a low-lying coastal area if you're intending to hold on to your land for a while, because that land might be gone. Some scientists postulate an even more extreme rise in sea levels, up to 90 meters. That would create a truly biblical catastrophe. London, Venice, Amsterdam, Berlin, even Paris would be underwater. Once you force a climate system with greenhouse gases, with what's been observed you know, over the past 100 or so years, you get this amplified warming. At the same time, the Earth will be ravaged by fearsome superstorms. Hurricanes feed on warm ocean water. The oceans are warming up. And so therefore, it makes sense that we ought to see more intense hurricanes as we move into the future we're going to see uh, more intense or extreme weather events of other types, for example, thunderstorms. We put this all together, and we're seeing a picture of change that humankind is going to have to deal with. People in developing countries would be affected first. Hundreds of thousands could perish. But nations like the United States are far from immune. I think we have this arrogance that Oh, in the Western world, we're fine. You know, we can deal with any sort of climate change. But, you know, you can look at things like Katrina happening, and we weren't prepared for that. But the reality is I think we're all vulnerable on the planet. Whether or not we're ready for global warming is a matter of conjecture. But there's no way to prepare for the next sign, a global war that will wipe out most of humanity. The final battle between good and evil.
Revelation calls it Armageddon. The final mystery of the seven signs is extremely complex. The book of Revelation is full of dreamlike symbolic imagery and hidden clues. Bible prophecy is really advanced intelligence from the mind of an all-knowing, all-seeing God. Just like intelligence at the CIA, where you have a little piece of information from one source and a little piece from another, and you have to put it together and connect the dots, Bible prophecy is this way also. Another factor adding to the complexity of the seven signs is that there are more than seven disasters contained within the seven signs. We've got three sets of seven judgments. Seven seems to be the perfect number. It's referred to the number that relates to God, as opposed to the Antichrist, whose number is 666. There is more than one interpretation of the prophecy, which is why others have abused it to mislead followers to their own deaths. Even some religious scholars are unsure about the exact interpretation of the seven signs. Whether these things are literal or somewhat uh, symbolic, I think we'll just have to wait and see. We've had plagues, we've had famines previously in human history, so whether these are the exact things that God is bringing about in this age to prepare for this generation, uh, having these judgments, that is just something that we can't speculate on. But one thing that is clear is the climactic judgment in the book of Revelation. The final sign, Armageddon. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him and against his army. According to Revelation, the first horseman of the apocalypse reappears the Antichrist. He has come to confront Jesus himself. It is the final battle between God and Satan. Good versus evil. This war is just horrific in its magnitude. All the nations of the earth will converge at that moment. Armageddon refers to a specific location. In the nation of Israel, there is a mountain called Har Megiddo, which means the mountain of Megiddo. And there have been 21 battles for control of that spot. Nations and empires have fought time and time again. The prophecy of Armageddon has left its mark on history. Some of those battles are fought by crusaders from the 11th through the 13th century. Many of these Christian warriors believe they are, in fact, fulfilling the violent prophecy of the seven signs. The Crusades were literally seen as a working out of the prophecies of Revelation because they were armies under the cross of Christ moving into the Holy Land, the site of the Battle of Armageddon, and doing battle with uh, infidel armies who they saw as diabolical. To this day, the Armageddon prophecy continues to exert a powerful hold on people's imaginations. Some of the more knowledgeable believers in the prophecy think we could be on the verge of Armageddon today. We live in a, a brutal, chaotic world, so much so that with weapons of mass destruction available and rogue individuals and nations and terrorists and so on, people are afraid that maybe this could be the end. To believers, the looming threat of nuclear war has always been tied to the concept of Armageddon. Looking at the nuclear arms buildup, the missing Russian suitcase nukes out of the former Soviet Union, the cataclysmic plagues of biological warfare being stored and manufactured in laboratories, I don't think there's ever been a time in the history of mankind where we have had the technology to literally decimate our world in a matter of weeks or months. As other weapons of mass destruction have emerged, even secular experts evoke images that echo the prophecy. There could be nuclear exchange. At which point, to protect our own interests, do we get involved with that or not? And if so, at what capacity? Do we launch strike packages to neutralize nuclear threat? Or do we just say, you know, 
let's just have at it. If the final prophecy culminates in nuclear Armageddon, the end will be similar to those caused by a large asteroid impact or a huge supervolcano eruption. The devastation of war will be followed by a nuclear winter, a shroud-like cloud of radioactive debris that will envelop the globe in darkness. We would now lower our global climate temperature by at least 10 degrees. As it got perpetually worse, we're screwed. And then the prevailing precipitation that would fall in the form of snow would be completely radioactive. In this frozen hell, we would meet our final apocalypse. But apocalypse doesn't mean our demise. It means something to be revealed. The journey through the seven signs only appears to be an unending litany of death and destruction. Starting with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, progressing to a mounting crescendo of horrific disasters, culminating with a final battle that could destroy everything on the planet, but to believers in the prophecy, the seven signs are not a countdown to the end of time. The signs signal a new beginning, a startling and symbolic wake-up call. The purpose is to grab a rebellious mankind's attention in an effort to bring mankind back to himself. And this is where the mystery of the seven signs is finally revealed. For amidst the devastation of the last sign, there is an unexpected end to Armageddon. And I saw an angel come down from the heaven, and he laid hold on Satan, and bound him, and cast him into the bottomless pit. Armageddon ends. Satan is defeated. Good triumphs over evil. And a period of peace and happiness begins on Earth that will last a thousand years. The bottom line is this, God's not some angry tyrant slinging down lightning bolts. God is love, and apocalypse is the unveiling of everlasting love. That's what it's all about. It's not about torture, and it's not about disease. It's about the love of God and bringing in a brand new world. Yes, the prophecy is meant to terrify a rebellious mankind, but it ends on a note of hope. That deep human need for hope is one of the main reasons why the seven signs are still relevant today. The book of Revelation has never been read with more earnest true belief than it is today. There's a certain irony there because we live in an age of science, of very advanced knowledge about the here and now, and yet even with all that advanced knowledge, there are people who say all that really matters is your religious beliefs, and those will be the final test of whether you live forever in paradise or burn forever in the lake of fire. Are the seven signs unfolding now? Despite all the evidence, it's still impossible to tell for sure. But there's one thing that can be said. The prophecy is every bit as powerful now as it was the very day it was written.